continue with our summer session series, uh, part two of Difference Makers. I want to share with you all, as I did last week, that each of us have the capacity to be a difference maker or a space taker. And we talked about what it means to be a difference maker, about living authentically and, loving, and living generously and living openly and inviting people to the table. We talked about what it means for us to get beyond this whole hashtag living my best life and seeing exactly why God placed me on this earth. Understanding that we have a purpose and we all are given certain gifts and talents to do greater than what sometimes we allow ourselves to do. Sometimes we're just happy and content with this whole idea of go with the flow. How many have heard that before? I'm just going with the flow. Going with the flow, it's okay when you want to just minimize some of the drama of life and we want to minimize having to cross the street to get to know somebody. But going with the flow is actually not godly. God never called you to go with the flow. If you, you, if you see throughout scripture, God always called his chosen ones to actually go against the flow. God has called you. God has designated you. God has equipped you to be a difference maker in the world. And you have to understand this truth that will always haunt you, which is, have I done all God has called me to do while I'm in the land called earth? Today, I want to look at Paul. But last week, we talked about Peter and how Peter did just that. Peter rocked the world of Jerusalem. He rocked the core of Jerusalem. With one sermon, he preached a word that caused 3,000 people to be saved in one sermon. I have yet to preach a sermon where 3,000 people get saved. Peter rocks the core of Jerusalem because he decided to step in the gap and involve himself in the messiness of ministry and God anointed him and many souls are ready to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to look at Paul and how Paul wanted to change the world, but he got into a place of a helpless state. He was a change agent. He was a difference maker. But Paul is dealing with some struggles right now that I think will help us as we go forward, especially with you who are here today as you struggle with making meaning of life. I want to help you from the life of Paul deal with some of the vicissitudes, changes, and transitions of going fast first but slowing down because of life. In Acts 18 chapter, we'll pick up with Paul's snippet of him struggling. Yes, Paul is struggling. It says in verse 8, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. Verse 9, <clears throat> and the Lord said to Paul in the night by vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Verse 10, for I am with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you. For I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. It is important that you learn a little bit at this time about Paul's background. At this time in Paul's ministry, he is on the tail end of his second missionary journey. He did three altogether. A missionary, for those who don't know, is a person who was given specific instructions from their chief, their lord, or their boss. Paul uh, understood this concept that his life would change, his direction would change, and what he did with his life would change once he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Paul understood that he could no longer be a murderer of Christians. Paul understood that were things he used to participate in that he could no longer participate in because now he was one of those Christ followers. When you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, your life changes. When you come into the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it is no longer what you want to do. It's what he wants to do through you and what he has destined and designated you to do in the land called earth. God wants you to understand that once you come under his Lordship, it is no longer about you dragging him to what you want and saying, God bless this. But it's you saying, God, wherever you lead me, I will follow. Paul understood that his life would change. The trajectory of his life would change. His direction would change. Different from Peter, uh, when, we, when we find that Peter ministered to the Jews, Paul was called to the Gentiles, and he had this constant battle. In every city he went, he would oftentimes go to the synagogue first, then to the Gentiles second. God allows the church to experience great things, and so what Paul come, come, come in to do, or came in to do, should I say, was to extend the great commission of the church. Remember in Acts 1 and 8, uh, God is speaking and tells them that you shall be witnesses unto me in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, for seven chapters, the children of God in Jerusalem just stayed fellowship and having good revival services and patting each other on the back on who preached the best. 
God had called them to spread the gospel throughout the earth. But they were content with staying in Jerusalem. In Acts 8 and 1, which is interesting how 1 and 8 is the commission. In 8 and 1, God sends adversity to the church. The church is persecuted and suddenly, guess what happens? The people spread out to Judea, Samaria, and to other parts of the world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me pause for a moment to help someone out because you might be wondering what does that mean for you? When God wants to get your attention because you wouldn't listen to him in times of peace, he will send you a message through adversity. God sometimes had to anoint your enemy to get you to move. And by move, I mean into your destiny because see, as long as things are comfortable, you're going to stay in the place of comfort. You're not going to stretch yourself. You're not going to extend yourself. You're not going to believe God for the greater things because you're comfortable. So God oftentimes has to disrupt our comfort to get us to become obedient. Church say amen. Amen. So Paul finds himself being a part of this great commission, this great, beautiful, redemptive story. In Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9, we find that Paul is saved encountering Jesus Christ. Paul is dramatically changed. He realizes that Jesus is truly Lord Curios. He takes the gospel of Jesus to the world as they knew it. And Paul becomes the vessel that God uses to reach the Gentile church, while Peter is the vessel that reaches the Jewish church. And now Paul still is struggling because on one hand, he wants to go to his brethren. He's very passionate about his pedigree. But God called Paul to go to the Gentile church. I need y'all to understand that Paul, as he is commissioned by the Lord, he becomes a missionary of God. But unlike today, unlike today, Paul has enough sense that just because he had a dramatic encounter with Jesus doesn't mean he's qualified to start preaching. He spends three years learning about Jesus under tutelage of someone who had been with Jesus and he learns and he grows. Unlike today, folk get saved and they are an apostle online tomorrow. Doing Facebook Live Bible studies and the problem is not them. The problem is that y'all actually listen to them. No pedigree, no resume, got nothing under their belt and the devil come, they run. But because they got a cash app handle, You decided to support it. Paul learns of the gospel. Three years later, starts preaching the gospel. He takes the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world as they knew it. You know, at different times and different seasons, they only could imagine the world being maybe a few countries over. But God had intended for the gospel to reach the world. Paul has three missionary journeys, traveled by foot, by boat, by horse, when possible, but mostly by foot. On his first journey, Paul travels to eight cities, which are also known today as modern-day Syria and Turkey of the countries. Of his second missionary journey, Paul travels to 17 cities comprised in the countries of Syria, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Greece. It is here that we pick up this particular text in verse number uh, 9 through verse number 11. Paul has been traveling to 25 cities up to this point. And Paul gets to a point where he's looking around and he's exhausted and he's tired. He's worn. He is weary. He doesn't know if he can go one more step forward. Look what verse 9 says. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by vision, do not be afraid any longer. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. No man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people. Read these next three words with me. In this city. Who is talking here? God. You you answered right for all three of you all that spoke up. (laughs) God is talking here. Can I tell you all in my experiences with God that God never wastes a word? Because everything God says, he understands there's power in the tongue. There's power of life and death in the tongue. So God doesn't waste a word. God doesn't elaborate. God speaks. Because God understands himself as being all powerful that what he says come to pass. Genesis 1, and God said, and it was so. So God doesn't have time to waste his words on anything. So everything that God says has a reason and a purpose to it. Look what it says. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you. For I have many people in, notice this word, this city. 
in this city. I have many people, powerful. I have many people in this city. Now, y'all got to capture that because now there's a background here that you have to really engage in. Because now you need to know what city is this he's talking about. And why does God use the specific term, this? We'll deal with that in a few seconds. In verse 11, he settled there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. What I have is a couple of issues here. Because, first of all, it shows nowhere, if you ever get the chance to read chapter 18, it shows nowhere in the entire chapter that Paul actually prayed. If God, if Paul didn't pray, why is God talking to him? That, that, that's, that's the pivotal question of this text. Well, that's for a few reasons. Number one, Paul was thinking about leaving the city of Corinth. Paul had been the target of religious opposition and demonic attack, and Paul honestly was tired. There comes a point in time where you're doing the work of God and you just get tired of dealing with the folk you're called to. If you've never been in ministry or volunteered for ministry or did anything behind the scenes, I love the people of God, but they can be a handful. Because all of them think they're the only one. <laughs> and they say, well, hold on. I'm the only one for you. Or I'm the only one in your presence right now. When in truth and reality, that's the juggling of thousands of activities and all kinds of responsibilities that go on in this hodgepodge called people and ministry. Paul has been stoned, talked about. Paul has been disqualified and degraded by the very people he prayed for, preached to, and uplifted. To that end, God says to him, don't be afraid any longer. Keep preaching. Don't shut up now. Now, that's a, well, a, 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 quite a powerful promise. He says, don't be afraid any longer. Keep preaching. Don't shut up now. Why? For I am with you. No man will attack you in order to harm you. Now, what's also important is when you ever see Scripture speak to something, it means that something is present. Verse 9, God says, don't be afraid any longer. It means that Paul was fearful in that moment. He was fearful. He was having some second thoughts or guesses in his mind as to his purpose, as to if God was with him, as to if the city of Corinth was worth it. He was scared as something was in the atmosphere that triggered fear. And if you've ever been in a place where you have been unfortunately experiencing fear, it can torment you. It can haunt you. It could cause you to miss opportunities. It could cause you to miss blessings. It could cause you to make some bad decisions. God tells Paul, do not fear any longer. And then he tells him these words, which I think is just powerful. He says, but go on speaking. Don't be silent for I am with you. Ain't nobody going to put a hand on you. I don't know if that makes you comfortable, but I love that. He want, in other words, God tells him, I'm going to give you a little bit of Isaiah 53 mixed up with Matthew 28 where it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper and I will be with you always, even into the ends of the earth. Puts both of them together and says, Paul, I got your back. Now notice what he says, no man will set out to harm you. The Greek construction of this sentence, no man will set on thee, literally means no one will be permitted to lay violent hands on you. Now stop, now there's something else going on. If Paul didn't pray and, and, and if Paul didn't ask God for any of this, then it says to us, one, that God is speaking to an unspoken request. Yeah. That God is ministering to Paul in his despondent state. And even though he's wrestling with it and ain't saying nothing about it, God is so tuned into Paul, he speaks to it before Paul asked about it. The other side of the coin is, at no point does it say in the chapter of 18 that men wanted to kill Paul. But God has a way of telling Paul that those who have set plans and plotted to kill you I've heard what they wanted to do and I'm telling you I have forbidden them to put hands on you I'm here to tell somebody here today that when you are in the will of God even your haters God says I didn't heard what they didn't try to say against you I didn't heard what they tried to do against you and you ain't got to worry about it I've already stopped them Okay, okay. See, that's why y'all shouldn't have to engage every dog that throws a stone. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to just say it just like that. Because some of us spend all of our energy trying to defend ourselves. Listen, keep doing what God called you to do and let folk criticize, talk about, let them make your name the name of the subject of their conversation all day long. But guess what they're doing? Talking about somebody God is using. It says that God heard his haters. Y'all didn't catch that. Y'all better read scripture again. It says, and everybody who tried to harm you, they won't be able to touch you. God spoke to his haters. And I don't know how God had the conversation. I don't know when God had the conversation. But I can tell you in my own life, in ministry, God has had conversations with people about me. I'll never forget when I took over pastoring, living the word church, right when my dad died. There was this old bishop walking around town. He would go in churches and try to take churches from people. He saw that I was a young man and he came in the church and told me, he says, by this time next month, this will be my church. Because I respected him and I thought he was a friend of my dad, I didn't want to get all what I'll call street on him. I went home, I was going to go do slime on him, but God held me back and kept me at 35th. But here's the deal. I started to pray about him and said, God, I don't know, know what, I don't know what to do about this real story. And the Lord talk, spoke to my heart and in prayer and said, I have taken care of him. This man called me and he said, I just want to tell you, I don't know who you are, but God has put the fear of God in me about you. Let me tell y'all something. When you are in the will of God God will stop your enemies y'all that's why I tell folk well, y'all better quit messing with God's chosen go mess with them folk that ain't chosen go mess with them folk that's barely saved go mess with them folk that's on the edge and don't know if they're going to heaven or hell but don't mess with those that's all the way over Pick on a devil, don't pick on a chosen vessel. I don't know why y'all think God will not speak on their behalf, but I've seen folk miss their blessing. I've seen God swallow up businesses. I've seen God curse health because you put your mouth on the wrong. Y'all better know who y'all messing with. See, we think, we think, we think that because we live in today's time that God ain't gonna reprimand us. See, y'all have to learn how to identify what is the reprimand of God versus what are circumstances. See, some of y'all have blamed the judgment of God on circumstances, but God is saying, no, nah, that's me. You didn't get that job because your mouth. And I wanted to show you, I would have opened that door had you shut your mouth, calm your nerves down, I'd have blessed you from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. But because of your mouth, you got to go through a drought right now. Here's the deal. No man shall set on thee, which means no one will be permitted. Now, y'all got to capture permission. Permission. Which means when Job was afflicted, he had to have permission. I'm going to give y'all two points here. When a person is in a fight and they got friends around, in streetology one-on-one, -on -one, the friend is permitted to help the friend who's in the fight. But don't get caught alone. Because then if they catch you on their turf in streetology one-on-one, -on -one, their friends are allowed to help them. Okay, let me help you out a little further because you ain't catching the spiritual revelation I just gave you. <laughs> when a person is being permitted to be attacked, you better get your licks in. Now, I'm not permitting you to get your licks in, but if you want to be silly, get your licks in when permission is allowed. But when permission isn't allowed, you better watch who you're hitting. Okay, some of y'all still missed the Dean. <laughs> see, see, there are times God will let you put your mouth on people. And then there are times he won't. Yeah. 
you got to learn, first of all, if you just stayed out of other folk business, you wouldn't have a worry about putting your mouth on anything. But since your nosy PhD having self got to be in everybody's business, you better be very careful what season God has that one in. Because even when God permits you to say something, God's going to hold you accountable to every word. It's in the book. He heard the conversation and wrote a book called Remembrance. I want to share with you all that Paul was dealing with this whole reality that he wanted to leave the city of Corinth. The second reason God speaks to him was that Paul was tired. He was exhausted. 25 cities in, he has been stone chased. He has been brought before kangaroo court. He has been brought on false charges, abandoned by colleagues and talked about by the very people he has preached to. But in Paul's story here, in Paul's narrative, there are three things we see God does with his chosen vessel. And I believe these three things will help us all out today. And I believe that if you walk with me, I think tomorrow you'll be a better, a better saint of God. You will be better suited to fight the war that you are dealing with right now. And you will overcome the valley moments much more quick. The first thing God does, shows us, is God secures Paul. He, yeah, yeah. He secures Paul. Let, let me be clear about this again. When God has his hand on somebody, he's going to make sure they are secured he will fight battles for them. He will kill gossip and deal with the gossiper. God will make it clear that you can talk about the unchosen, but you can't talk about the chosen. He will supplement them when they are low, strengthen them when they are weak, which leads me to the definition of what does it mean to be secure? Well, the definition of secure means to fix or to attach firmly so that it cannot be moved or lost. Can I, can I share that again? It means to be firmly attached so that it cannot be moved or lost. Okay, let me help y'all out who are here today. A synonym for secure is shield, shelter, or keep out of harm's way. See, when God secures you, he shelters you, he shields you, and keep you out of harm's way. That's what the old saints would pray or pray, Lord, keep me from danger. See? Because when God and you are on the same page and you're walking in the will of God, God has a way of keeping your drama free. God has a way of keeping you out of calamity. God has a way of shielding you from harm. Now, I need y'all to capture this, is that God secures Paul. Look what he does in verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by vision, do not be afraid any longer, man, but go on speaking and do not be silent. He says, I know, Paul, you feel disqualified because, you know, in today's time, we actually get a little joy out of disqualifying preachers. We get happy when we find someone in the Christian faith has fallen on their faces. We get excited like you win a prize or something, like you won the lottery, like somehow you have been selected to a vacation in the Bahamas. It's like you get a, a sense of joy out of that. But here God shows us is that when you are in God's will and you are God's vessel, God has a way of speaking to the atmosphere to keep you on track. God stands in the midst of our suffering and says, I know you're going through a tough time. I know you want to give up, but I can't let you throw in the towel right now. He says, I can't let my soldier ache any longer. And God tells him, keep on speaking. Oh, I love that. Let me help y'all out. Paul felt disqualified. Paul, Paul felt inept. He felt unqualified. He felt like he wasn't doing a good job. But God says to him, keep on speaking. Keep on preaching. And I want to share this attack on the body that is happening within various realms. The enemy understands if he can stop God's chosen mouthpieces from speaking to you, he can stop your faith from being built. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and how can they hear without a preacher God has set up an order for you to be edified by a chosen preacher if the enemy can muzzle the mouth of the preacher and cause you to condescend your reverence of your preacher suddenly you go miss out on faith building lessons that's going to help you for your next assignment count it a joke if you want to but God will send you to the assignment without the equipment because you refuse to show up to be equipped I said a mouthful and I got about a five of y'all saying amen I thought y'all wanted me back <laughs> say amen somebody 
When you say amen, it helps me stop repeating myself. God tells him to keep on preaching. Don't be silent. In other words, he tells him in the words that we could use one secular theologian who ain't saved, but we're going to sanctify his words. He says to him, in other words, don't stop, get it, get it. All right, see, that caught y'all attention right there. Yes, y'all like, oh, I woke up now. Thank y'all for waking up. Nudge your neighbor says, don't be silent, don't be silent. Yeah, 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 that was your wake-up call. That was your wake-up call. He tells him, don't be silent in the moment of your adversity. But here is something I need to share with you all that makes me understand this even greater. If we were to personify Paul's state, one would have to see how his tiredness caused him to want to stop teaching and preaching. Can I ask y'all a question? Thank you so much for saying yes. How are you helping your preacher and pastor? Is he constantly on trial? Is he still in orientation after five years? Or are you here for God reasons or flesh reasons? Are you a trap artist or a kingdom builder? Do you add to the pastor? Oh, I'm talking in the house today. Are you add to the pastor or are you subtracting from the church? How many of y'all are hearing voices that ain't God's voice? Stuff like he's your husband, baby, no. Nope, nope. I don't care who you heard. It wasn't God, it was White Castles. Because if he ain't talking to me, he sure enough ain't telling you. What, what, are you here to build the kingdom? Are you here for us to accomplish a bigger goal? Or are you just here to take up space? Ooh God help me. I think I'm going to get some emails saying, uh, Pastor, after careful consideration, the Lord has led me. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, the, the re reality of it is we miss God when we allow ourselves to be the stumbling block to the kingdom. And oftentimes we want great churches, but we will sit in great churches to be and do nothing we're called to and criticize everything that's done. And God is saying to us today, how you helping the preacher? How you helping the church? Oh God, help me. Let me stay right here because y'all ain't saying that. I'm going to repeat my, how are you using your giftedness for the body of Christ? How are you using your time for the body of Christ? How are you using your influence for the body of Christ? Okay, I, mean, I, I got two y'all. Let me get about four more y'all and then I'll go to another point. How are you using your unique set of talents? Ooh, help me God, help me God. It's amazing to me how we will share a fight video but won't share a sermon. It's amazing to me how we'll Instagram our shape but we won't Instagram how we've been shaped by God. It's amazing to me how we will snap all of your vents and frustrations, but you won't snap how the Lord made a way. Snap is Snapchat for those who don't know. It's amazing to me how we'll use all the venues for flesh, but never for God. Who you're rolling with? Who you're rolling with? Who's your Lord? Who's your Savior? Or is God only pertinent when you need a miracle? See, I can tell by your timeline knowing who you serve. God help me Jesus I'm in your house I'm talking about you my brothers and sisters since she didn't say nothing let me repeat myself again how are you using what God gave you to advance the kingdom of God how are you using your unique set of skills you know that test you pray for in college to pass and you know you walked out of there feeling dumber than when you walked in just a few of us felt like that. I know, right? Just a few of us. I'm one of them. <laughs> Studied all three days and walked out feeling dumber. I had to have missed this book. I must, he must have signed a whole new book. <laughs> walked out when you prayed, after you prayed and trusted God and you found out somebody, somebody did worse than you. <laughs> like two-thirds of the class set the curve. Somehow that puts you right in the middle. You're like, praise the name of Jesus, pass. <laughs> Thank God for folk that felt dumber than me. <laughs> See, I'm, I, I want to get y'all to understand the truth of the matter is how are you using that particular subject matter for the kingdom? 
There are people right next to you who have such giftedness and they are using it not one ounce of the kingdom because they have been proverbially hurt by church. I need to tell y'all something proverbially because I ain't saying it ain't real. I'm not affirming uh, or I'm not disavowing your experience. But at some point, I have to ask you the question Jesus asked the man by the pool of Bethesda. Wilt thou be made whole? How much longer must the church be protested against because you was hurt in 1996? How much longer must the church be stopped and hindered, lacking because you were hurt in 1975? How much longer? must the church miss out on your unique set of abilities because you had a disagreement with leadership how much longer must heaven stop doing what heaven wants to do in your life because there was a disagreement with you and the usher now I'm going to come home to y'all seen folk go in Walmart and play with a Walmart air gun and get killed and you ain't stopped going to Walmart. I've seen folk go to Target and get accosted and told they were stealing when they were not and you ain't stopped going to Target. But for some reason, because a usher who had a bad day didn't smile, lay out the red carpet and say, I see you having a good day, suddenly you've done with all churches. Come on. Preach Hawkins. And yet we have this excuse we are using that is legitimately allowing us to pause our usage of God or being used by God. And I'm here to ask the question like Paul would ask you is what are you doing with your gift? God says to him in verse 9, but go on man, speaking and don't be silent. Go on and do what I call you to do. And so God does something powerful. He secures them. The second thing God does is he supplies for Paul. The scripture tell us that God is a supplier of our needs and a giver of our wants. If the Bible says if I delight myself in the Lord, he will give me the desires. Listen, delight means I find my joy in him. I find my happiness in him. I find my peace in him. That's why you can never discount a child of God who got all hell breaking loose around them. If they have learned the secret of delighting themselves in the Lord, you're going to ask the question, why you're smiling? I'm delighting in the Lord. Why you're blessed? I'm delighting in the Lord. Why you still got your peace? I'm delighting. Come on, give God some praise, I ain't. He supplies. He supplies. Oh, see. Okay, okay. Let me talk to the folk who sold out on this thing. Now, God doesn't supply some of my needs or the big needs only. But God. God supplies all of my needs. When I need encouragement, he's right there. When I need a way made out of no way, he's right there. When I need supernatural on my side, he's right there. When I need joy, he's right there. When I need provision, he's right there. Yeah, he's right there. I'm sorry, let me behave. I'll behave, I'm trying. I'll behave. Let me act like I have some decorum and some sense. Let me, let me play in the role of those uh, preachers you do support. Today, we're going to be pulling from the book of Acts, the 18th chapter. I'll tell you about my dad and his pond. Okay, let me go on. God, Paul, Paul is having an Elijah moment. Y'all remember Elijah who fights against the Baal prophets. God rains down fire on Mount Carmel there and Jezebel sends him a letter and tells Elijah the prophet that by this time tomorrow you will be dead like them 
the man runs into the wilderness away from his calling and assignment, saying to God, I'm the only one who has been jealous for you. I mean, literally, the man just sees fire rain from heaven and you worried about a letter. But sometimes the enemy has a way of capturing you at the right moment. He's running away. He goes under the juniper tree. He prays to God that God would take his life. He says, God, take my life because I have been jealous for you and I'm the only one. He uses this word only one about five times. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. Suddenly he's under the juniper tree. He prays that God would take his life. An angel, he wakes up. An angel is standing before him, slaps him, gives him bread and says, here, eat this because the journey ahead is long. Certainly Elijah's thinking certainly I'm in heaven, but he felt pain. So he knows the truth about heaven There is no pain in heaven. He realizes he ain't in heaven He on earth because God wasn't done with him yet God was giving him a wake-up call because sometimes God has to slap you to use you yeah. Boy, I'm rich with revelation. I got more word than you got time Gives him one piece of bread and he goes 40 days on one piece of bread what does that mean, preacher? What does that mean? It means that when God supplies for you, you don't have to keep second guess where the blessing is coming from. Because all God does is he supplies and his supply keeps on supplying. That's why I got peace. Because God blessed me with what I got. I didn't bless myself. God blessed me with this. All right, all right, all right. Let me, let me. Ooh, okay, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm misbehaving today. I want to share this with you all. Scriptures tell us that God is, ne- God is revealed in Scripture as Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord, our provider, or the one who provides. It is so wonderful to know that God is my source and he cares about everything I care about, from the smallest to the largest thing in my life. God provides. And the Bible also says that he's my shelter, my refuge, my hiding place, Psalms 91. Second Corinthians 1 and 3, it says he's the one who comforts me. Psalms 103 and 3, he's the one who heals me. James 1 and 5, he's the one that gives me wisdom. I'm here to tell you, God ain't just my provider of some stuff. He's my provider of everything I need. Look what God tells him. He supplies for his man. He says to him, verse 10, for I have many. Stop. Go back to Elijah. So when Elijah wakes up, God tells him, oh, by the way, I got 5,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. You know what God is saying to him? He is saying to him, not only do I got many people in this city, Paul, I never call you to do it by yourself. Some of y'all right now are struggling with your assignment because you think God called you by yourself. For some reason, we get a little adrenaline thinking we're the only one. Y'all know, uh, years ago, everybody was talking about, God called me to take the city. (laughs) Felt good till we found out you didn't take the city. Get that key back, because you ain't got it. See, God never called one person to do the entire work of God. He called us to be in a collection of talented, gifted, anointed people. Why do I got to fight you if we serve Jesus? Let's just get this thing done before we all die and expire. Amen, amen. Here's what I need to share share with y'all. He says, I have many people in this city. God tells him the word this because he was ready to leave Corinth. Paul was ready to leave. And I want to share with you all, he felt alone and thought his answer and his success was in another city. Oh, I'm about to come to your house. Ooh, they say I got four minutes, but I'm going to take five. He's God was making it clear to Paul that God had worked for him in this city. Corinth was messy. If y'all ever read the book of Corinthians, today's sin of church in church ain't nowhere near compared to what was going on in the church of Corinth. We ain't got nowhere near that. God forbid we ever do. And Paul was like, these people don't want the gospel. Ain't nothing good happening here. They want to serve the devil. But God said, stop it, boy. I got an assignment on your life for this city. Now, here's what he says. He says here, he says, Paul, you thought your answer was in leaving. But your answer is in staying. Ooh, I'm coming home. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, I'm serving this. I'm serving this 90 mile per hour fastball right down the middle for a home run. Here's the deal. Some of you all are in love with newness fascination and you swear that you are one relocation from happiness. 
That's called dropping the mic. Y'all ain't catching. <laughs> I need to talk to those of you who feel like your usefulness can be more celebrated anywhere but here. And you think that if you just go elsewhere, it'll all make sense. I'm going to tell y'all, do some careful investigation of your friends that's flossing that they at a new site and it's so much more wonderful because there's clubs they've never been to. Because there's a state fair that's bigger than the one you've been to. It's big here. I ain't never seen one this big. It's live here. It's all the way live, lit, litty, here. And they give you this impression of happiness. I'm going to expose the lie. Do research. Because they go talking big, but when you go visit them, you find out they're the chief cook at Whataburger. And they will say, oh, that's just me working on my bag. Real ballers don't have to create the bag when they get there. Real ballers take the bag with them. I done took y'all all the way to school to back and you mad at me. Here's the thing I'm trying to get y'all to understand. We have been fascinated and even paused our ability to sow into where God has assigned because we are waiting on the next move to be the answer to our loneliness. You even say stuff like, the men are better elsewhere. If nobody wants you here, the men you didn't advertise 4,000 ways on social media men I get married we know you single you've been single for 28 years putting all your little food online think I make good meals we don't care (laughs) Chick-fil-a has replaced you (laughs) and they nice with it how can I serve you you throwing plates on the table here. <laughs> Eight dollars in happiness. He like, oh, okay, baby girl, you've almost got married. <laughs> we demonize where we are, not realizing we're playing into a theme that Satan, I believe, has released to the body of Christ. Relocation, infatuation. It's better down south. It's better out east. It's better out southeast. It's better. It's better. It's better. And not realizing that when you get there, guess what? You got to deal with people and traffic and bills. And they, they're like the movie Taken. They gonna find you. I'm just trying to get you to understand that God is telling Paul something we struggle with today, Paul struggled with then. It's not new. Thinking that because it ain't going all the way right, it must be that we shouldn't be here. But God tells Paul in the midnight hour, I got many people here. Stay faithful. I'll bless you. Keep speaking and keep sowing and I'll make your name great through me. He says, in messy Corinth, I got purpose. I need to share this with you all. Math- mathematically speaking, logically speaking, there is no just add water anywhere. Just, it ain't gonna happen when you pop up. So many preachers I've speak, spoken to that I get access to over the years who think that they, if they just go to any other city, they'll be mega. 3,000 members, big huge sanctuary, big on this and big on that. And I tell them, listen, bro, you can't even get the air conditioner fixed in your church. And you talking about you can manage 100 people on staff and pastor 3,000 people? Y'all got five people and y'all have church, one service from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm not knocking you, but you might want to start working on yourself as though you're already there. Because when you get there, it ain't coming to you. See, we oftentimes think that elsewhere it's going to be so much better. There are so many artists who believe if I just get out of St. Louis, I'll be great. Interview them. They've gone. 
bigger stages? Have they sold more CDs? No. no. <laughs> facts. Hashtag facts. facts. I know preachers going to other cities, taking over churches. Have they all of a sudden hit it? Which, why are we trying to make that the goal anyway? When did church become monetized to your ego? Woo, I didn't preach that. See, some of us are missing the voice of God because we're listening to the voice of appearance. Some of us are missing the blessing of God because we are tired and exhausted and we can't see clearly because we have, we have allowed the elements outside of us to get the best of us. God tells them many people, which means number one, God created us to do something collective. God never called you into a solo journey. God never called you to be the only one. God never called you to be the star of the show. God called you to be part of a team. Which leads me to point two, God called you into community. God told Paul, I have much people in this city and church. We have this Read One program that we're implementing and we are partnering with Katie Harper Wright. Uh, Miss Kendra Smith was a part of our first service and she gave the, the blessing to this partnership. And listen, if there's ever a time for you to be a part of the body of Christ moving with legs and feet and hands, it's now. We need you to sign up. We need you to be a part of something that's gonna change what? This city. Let me tell you all something. God was at work while Paul was worried. Look at verse number eight. Here's the proof. Crispus, the synagogue leader, did what? Believed in the Lord with all of his household and many of the what? Corinthians, when they what? Heard, were what? Believing and? See, God was saying, Paul, I done already told you I got a purpose for you in this city. That I'm already saving people and I need you to not stop. Who am I saving? The very people you cherish the most, Paul. Your Jewish heritage. I save the synagogue leader as proof that I am ministering even when you ain't talking. And not only that, the Corinthians are being saved as if to say we're believing would indicate to us in the Greek that even while I'm talking to you, Paul, I'm saving them right now. So Paul, get over yourself. That's what God is saying. Get over yourself. Church, can I tell y'all today, it ain't just about you and hashtag living my best life. Could I just inform you that resistance is oftentimes an indicator you're in the will of God. Because the devil never resists what ain't in the will of God. Last point. So God secures him, God supplies him, then God stabilizes Paul. Let me tell y'all something. Life will have a way of making you feel unstable. Loneliness, exhaustion, personal attack can make you feel destabilized. Do I have a witness here? Bills, job loss, trouble, sickness, family going nuts and crazy, putting the fun and dysfunctional will make you feel destabilized. You can feel like the world has been uprooted around you because of, you see a lack of results. Anybody ever felt like that? Like I'm just not seeing the results. A lack of resources, people ain't supporting you. A lack of support in general, people kind of just hate on folk today for no reason. If they can't find you in nothing else, they just put you in stuff. I saw the pastor at the store. He was buying some socks. <laughs> what kind of man of God? <laughs> Buy socks. Just looking for stuff. <laughs> Lack of affirmation. Affirmation means you give people vocal, verbal support. Like, I believe in you. Today's time, we want people to fail so much that we get joy out of failure. We living in some twisted times where we're becoming cold-hearted and evil. Like, we, we're, becoming this, we're becoming this group that has become the, our brother's killer and not keeper. 
In today's time, I've never seen a day whereby we make fools famous, but we desecrate the work of the faithful. We, we, we make fools famous, but we desecrate the work of the faithful. I've never seen a day where folk can get on their various social platforms and say stuff like, F the church. And still get booked by a church. Never in my life did I see people who say hell ain't real. Undermining the very words of Jesus and still get called a sing at someone's church assembly. And get defended by the Johnny Cochran's of church. But the faithful get a booger on their nose. Never was real anyway. Are we losing our spiritual elasticity in order to fit in with anybody who say they are of Jesus? Okay, let me take out the scriptures in Matthew 7. Jesus makes it very clear. In that day, they will say, didn't I do miracles in your name? Didn't I pro- prophesy in your name? Didn't I do all manner of things in your name? And Jesus will say, I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. We are living in a day and time where we make fools famous. We denigrate and desecrate the faithful. Never in my day and time where we will get 20,000 viewers for a guy who say he is delivered. And we get joy out of it. And we get a level of entertainment out of it. Not realizing all of this stuff is a distraction to the bigger cause of God. Why are you saying this, preacher? Because if I don't, obviously there's a whole lot of people saying, ah, she just kept it real. I'm so tired of you keep it real, folk. Everybody want to keep it real until it's real about them. At no point in my keeping it real will I ever say F the church. At no point in my keeping it real will I ever say it's a sham. I love Jesus. I love his church. I don't know about you, but Jesus saved me. The church preserved me. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side. Oh my side, you talk about my Jesus, I'm ready to punch you because he made a way for me. I don't care how the saints of God treat me. Trust me, there are times I want to pull my pistol out. But they are God's children. Bible says my inheritance is among them that are sanctified. I would never say that the church is a bad place. It got its problems, but it's God's church. I'm going to stay right here for a few more minutes and pray this go viral. It's important that we get to the place Well, we start defending what God is doing and stop making fools famous. Church of God, if there's ever a time and a season that we need to be conscientious of scriptures, now is the time where Jesus says, in the last days there will be a great falling away of people who called on Christ and sang songs and even preached and When the times of difficulty come, they will shift with the sands. And they will go from followers to unfollowers. They will go from friends to being blocked. And they will say, I used to be with him, but no longer because he's no longer beneficial for my opportunism. My brothers and sisters, this is the time right now. That God is calling us to be faithful. See, God never called you just to be happy. When we get before God, he's not going to say, hashtag, you really did have a good time. Scriptures are clear. He will say these words, well done. How good and faithful. 
Yeah, I skipped all the way to the end to get to the end because I believe God, you know, he's just shifting us in this particular part, in this particular sermon here. Here's what you got to get, that we've got to defend the church of God. It ain't got to be your cup of tea, it's mine. I, I can't tell you how many times I wanted to commit suicide, but when no one was around, but the law intervened. Say what you want to say. Deal with what you... You can say the universe intervened for you. Go right ahead. Call on the universe when you need the universe. I, got, I know who created it. I call on Jesus. When I nearly lost my life in the late 80s when the gang violence was for real, for real. And the bloods and the crips, well, it was the bloods and the gangster disciples of St. Louis and East St. Louis got into a turf war and they came to our school, Clark Junior High School on State Street in East St. Louis, and they lined the block in red. Well, our school colors are red. And they had to release us from school. Literally, the intercom, the principal came over the intercom and said, y'all must go home right now. I came out of gym with my red hoodie on, had no idea with my blue coat over it, so I'm really confused now. I'm standing at the bus stop. I, I didn't have no one to call. We didn't have cell phones. Mom and dad worked deep in St. Louis, and so I'm standing at the bus stop, just hoping and praying, surrounded by these bloods, just saying, God, just let me get home. And I feel this nozzle in my back, and the guy says, who you with? All I could say in that moment, Jesus. I didn't say it loud, Jesus. He pulls the trigger, click, says to me, it's your lucky day. Tell y'all something, F the church? It's a sham? And we living in a day and time where we will defend them and kill faithful people. Yes. Yes. Do y'all capture the severity of this? This ain't something about just praying for people. We got to call it out. Yes. At no point in all my displeasure with people would I ever cast them to a place of illegitimacy in hell. Because God saved you. He loved you. He gave his only begotten son for you. And then I'm going to say, when they don't go my way, forget him. Well, I'm sorry, F him. Do y'all capture how we are in times? What about if there's ever a time for faithful people? Now the faithful people need to rise up. The church has become a stage that we have to eliminate this stardom. This is not real housewives of church. Everybody want to be famous. Let me be Christian famous. No, let me be faithful. Let me go through those moments like Paul, who I believe was ready to quit. And God comes to him in the night and says, don't stop. <laughs>